We are glad you are with us. To help guide you along with tonight's message, consider using the sermon notes found on the YouVersion app. You can open the app and look for the three lines in the bottom right-hand corner. Look for the events section. In the search bar, type in Golden Acres Baptist Church. You'll see our tab with a live indication. Click on it. There, you'll find the notes for the message. We hope this helps you dive deeper into God's Word. Hello, GABC Faith family and friends. We are so excited to have you here today. There are great things happening here and we would love for you to be a part of it. Summer is almost here and planning for BBS is underway for July 17th through the 20th. Kids and workers will be able to register on our website June 1st. The Russell Baptist Association is kicking off their annual Teachers Missions 2022. GABC has agreed to donate 200 containers of Lysol wipes. And all donations must be turned in on or by July 8th. We will need two volunteers for the packing party on July 19th at Somerville Baptist Church. Thank you for your support. The GABC Broken Ministry would like to invite anyone in need of healing from a child loss experience to attend their next meeting on June 22nd at 6 p.m. in the depot room A with Dr. Helen Peterson. A light supper and child care is provided. Register on our website by June 20th. At GABC, we do not baptize babies, but we partner with parents in praying for children and making sure they hear about Jesus and His saving grace. Our next baby dedication is Father's Day, June 19th. Please register online at gabcpc.com by Wednesday, June 15th. Stop by the Sanctuary Foyer for the Baby Bottle Boomerang Fundraiser from Sound Choices for Life. Sound Choices offers mothers and babies real answers from real concerns. Collect dollars and change to fill up your bottle and turn in on Father's Day, June 19th. At Golden Acres, we do not pass an offering plate. If you want to give tithes and offerings to the ministries here, you can place all gifts in the wooden joy boxes located at each sanctuary entrance or give online at gabcpc.com or through the Ministry One GABC app. We thank you for your gift. Remember, God loves you and have a blessed week. Everybody stand to your feet and let's worship the Lord together today, all right? Hey, we serve a good God today. That's why we're here to worship Him and to hear from Him. Let's do that. Come on, sing together. I can't count the times I've called your name some broken night. And you showed up and patched me up like you do every time I get amnesia I forget that you keep coming around yeah, there ain't no way you'll ever let me down 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 good God almighty I hope you'll find me praising your name no matter what comes cause I know Top of my lungs. He's good. He's good. He's God. He is good. God Almighty. You say your love goes on forever. That your mercy never stops. So why would I assume you'd be somebody that you're not? 
like sun in the morning. I know you're gonna be there every day. So what on earth could make me be afraid, afraid, afraid? Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me praising your name no matter what comes. Cause I know where I Keep praising your name at the top of my lungs. He's good. He's God. He is good God Almighty. Come on, praise him today. Praise him in the morning. Praise him in the noontime. Praise him when the sun goes down. Love him in the morning, love him in the noontime, love him when the sun goes down. Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me, praising your name no matter what comes. Cause I know where I'd be without your mercy, so I keep praising your name at the top of my In the morning, Jesus in the new time, Jesus when the sun goes down. Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the new time, Jesus when the sun goes down. There's one. He was called Emmanuel. His name is Jesus, and he's the Messiah. He is the soon coming king. He is Lord. He is in charge. He's on the throne. Praise his name today.
He's life. He is love. He's God. Uh, and he's worthy of our praise today. So just lift your, lift your voice. Lift your voice to him. Just forget about everything else. Just lift your voice to him and worship him. Sing it.
It's your breath, come on, sing, in our lives. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lives. So we pour out our praise to you, oh, it's your breath in our lives. Lord, you're great. Scripture says you're greatly to be praised. And we praise you in this place today. Things go on around us, Lord. We we have questions and we wonder. But, Lord, at the end of the day, you're God and you're still God. And you still want us to worship you and praise you. You are the cornerstone, not just of of your church you're the cornerstone of this church and lord i pray that that is the case every day hereafter days preceding and days afterwards you are the chief cornerstone and our hope our faith is on nothing less than that
trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Sing Christ alone. Christ the seated. Levels. But for some, the reward is a personal one. The knowledge that they finished what they set out to do. A little over an hour after the winner of the marathon crossed the finish line, John Stephen Aquari of Tanzania approaches the stadium, the last man to complete the journey. A voice calls from within to go on, and so he goes on. Afterwards, it was written, Today we have seen a young African runner who symbolizes the finest in the human spirit, a performance that gives true dignity to sport, a performance that lifts sport out of the category of grown men playing at games, a performance that gives meaning to the word courage. Perhaps the words of John Stephen Aquari epitomize all that is right in the human spirit. When asked why he did not quit, he said simply, My country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. The light in this Tanzanian runner is a beacon to us all to endure to the end, to finish the race, however long and hard the road. I'm overwhelmed at this story for several reasons. And I got to tell you, I heard something this time that I didn't hear other times. I heard the roar of the crowd. And I want to remind you that he, he didn't win the gold. He didn't win the silver. He didn't win the bronze. He just finished the race. He finished the race. I know you just sat down just a few moments ago, but, but out of respect for reading of God's word, would you please stand with me and turn to Hebrews chapter 12? If I told you I was comfortable this morning, that would be one of the biggest mis misconceptions I had construed in all of my life. I'm not comfortable. Get me behind a microphone and I can sing. But today is, is very uncomfortable. But God says to be instant in season in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy maybe. 
Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says this. Read with me, and I'm reading from the King James Version. Therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, consider him. He's our example. Consider him. If nobody else consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. God, I've prayed and I've begged and I've pleaded, please take control of my faculties, my mind, my spirit. Let these people assembled in this place today not hear the voice of a, a, a meager man. May we hear the voice of God. May I hear the voice of God. May you speak to me. If you don't speak to anybody else in this room, speak to me. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing and, and thinking about today and, and thinking about the challenge that we're faced with today. I was thinking, what could I say that would help us as a church? The one thing that kept coming back to my mind was just focus. Just, just focus. Focus on the finish. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Just Block out the noise. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And today's message is, is a simple message, and I hope that you'll take this not just today, but tomorrow, throughout the week, next week, next month, you'll remember this message, and you'll say, just focus on the finish. Just focus on the finish. In this passage of Scripture, um, I, I've heard several pastors say this. When you see the word, therefore, you've got to see you got to understand what's the therefore, therefore. And if you know anything about this passage of Scripture, you know it's referring back to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And that's where we find the passage of Scripture that says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. But following that, there's, there's several, several people who are listed in, in giving credence to their ability to withstand persecution and just persevering to the very end. Folks like Moses, Noah, Abraham, and some of them may not necessarily have faced persecution. They just had some obstacles in their way, and then they, pushed, they just pushed right on through. But today, we're, we're looking at the race that is set before us. And race, let me tell you, it's from a Greek word called agon. And that's where we get the word agony. And you know what I think the writer of Hebrews is trying to tell us today? He's trying to tell us that running a race, and I was talking with Christy Spivey the other day, and she was talking about how she used to run. If I run to the parking lot, I'm going to be winded. I just don't like to run. I've never have liked to run. I enjoy fitness, but I just don't like to run. But the writer in this passage of Scripture is saying that running could be, could be agony. It could be difficult. The Christian life, listen, let's, let's just throw out the word Christian life from that phrase. Life is hard. Life is not, life's not easy. The Christian life, it's not easy. However, I want to say this. It pays to serve Jesus. It pays every day to serve Jesus. It pays every step of the way to serve Jesus. But I'm going to tell you something else. It costs something. It costs something to serve Jesus. It costs something every single day to serve Jesus. It's not easy. The Christian life, it calls for three things. The discipline of an athlete, the endurance of a marathon runner, and the determination of a champion. And, and today, listen, if there's anything that happens today, I want you to examine your race. Don't examine my race. Don't examine your neighbor's race. Don't examine somebody else's race. Let's, I want to look at my race. You know why? Because it's a personal race. It's personal. Every, the Bible says take up your cross. Not take up 
Doug's cross. Take up my cross. Take up Jesus' cross. It's, we have a personal race to run. It says, let us run with perseverance the race that is set out before us. I'm in a race. You're in a race. You've got a track. I've got a track. You've got a lane. I've got a lane. And fortunately, we're not racing specifically against one another. We're not, so there's no, no room for jealousy in God's kingdom. We've got our own track. But we all have our own race to run, and it's a personal race. But it's also a permanent race. Once you're in this race, you're in it. Once you're in it, you're in it for life. I'm going to give you some good news, guys. I'm going to give you some bad news. People usually say, give me the good news first. Every Christian will finish the race. Every Christian will finish the race. But the bad news is not every Christian will win the race. I want you to look, if you've got your Bible still open, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. And while you're turning there, I want to tell you, God's not just looking for runners in the race. He wants folks to win the race. He wants folks to win this race. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? We all run. But one receives the, ride, one receives the prize. So this is the challenge. Run in such a way that you're the one to win it. Run this race as if you are racing against somebody. As if you are, and, I, and I've said this before, guys, and there, there are times I have highs and I have lows in my, my, my Christian, and there are times when, I, when I'm praying and I say, God, when you look down on this earth with your all-seeing eye, I want you to see me above everybody else. I want you to see me praying the longest. I want you to see me worshiping you the loudest. I want you to see me um, studying your word the longest. I want to be head and shoulders above the rest. And that may not always be the case. But that's called an aspiration to want to win. That's an aspiration to want to win. God just doesn't want folks to just get in the race. He wants us to have the desire to win the race. Every single morning we wake up, folks, we ought to put on our running shoes, put on our running clothes, toe the line, and get ready to run in this race as if we are wanting to run, run this race to win. And there are three things that I want to look at specifically. There are three things I want to look at specifically about running this race that we have got to nail down before we're, we're able to be a winner. But I, I also want... I don't know how many of you do this, but I love the YouVersion Bible app. The YouVersion Bible app has so many different um, Bible studies you can read through. They, if you don't like a long Bible study, you can start a three-day Bible study or a, a five-day study. There was one I started, and it was on this passage of Scripture, Hebrews chapter 12. And it talked about the witnesses. Witnesses. And automatically, you would say that those witnesses are the people listed in Hebrews chapter 11 in the previous chapter. But Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 says this, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning. I want to say that again. Whatever things were written before were written for our learning. I'm going to tell you like, like this. If somebody makes a mistake, I want to learn from their mistake, not my mistake. If somebody has to learn the hard way, I want to look at them and say, wow, I don't want to do that. Romans 15 verse 4 says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and the comfort of the Scriptures, we might have hope. So let me give you a couple of illustrations about this. If you're thinking about quitting altogether, if you think you just throw, want to throw in the towel, I'm done, I'm going to quit. But old Job... Here's Job. He steps up and says, well, I've been where you are. Listen, let me tell you what I've lost. I lost my family. I lost my home. 
I lost my possessions. I thought I lost my future. My wife lost her brains because she tried to tell me to curse you and die. But she found out God was still faithful. Or he found out God was still faithful. Job found out God was still faithful in the midst of all the troubles and trials that he had. So I would say to you, based on Job's experience, based on the things that were learned from his experience, we still have hope we can hang in there. But somebody else might say, well, Todd, I'm thinking about quitting. I can tell you why I'm quitting about thinking, because life just hasn't been fair to me. Just hasn't been fair to me. Well, do tell. Tell me how life hasn't been fair to you. I mean, you can get in line behind me because I've had some pretty difficult days myself. But then somebody else stands up. Somebody by the name of Joseph. And Joseph says, well, I've been right where you are. I know what it's like to have your brothers leave you in a pit for dead. I know what it's like to serve 13 years in prison for something I didn't even do. But you know what I learned? I learned God's faithful. I learned God's faithful. The testimony of Job, the testimony of Joseph. Somebody else might say, well, Todd, I, I really want to quit because, to be honest with you, I'm facing the biggest problem in my life. David stands up and says, you going to talk about big problems? You going to talk about big problems? They laughed at me when I stood up to him. He was a giant. His name was David. And by the help of God, I, I was able to defeat him with a sling and a stone. So I could tell you, don't quit. Persevere to the end. Hang in there. God is able to see you through. And if that's not enough comfort, Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, says this. Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. And he caps it off with a big hearty amen. And amen says, so shall it be. So look, look, back, look back at the first scripture, Hebrews 12, 1. This is our first point. You got to lay, lay aside every weight. Lay aside, lay beside whatever weighs you down. So what is a weight? Now, I do know that in this passage of Scripture, it talks about weight and it talks about sin. So there might be some ambiguity there. What, is, what specifically is a weight? Okay. A weight could be something that's not necessarily bad, but it keeps you from God. A weight could be a habit. A weight could be a hobby. A weight could be the pursuit of a career. A weight could be a relationship. Watch this. In Abraham's case, a weight could have been Isaac. But we know Abraham was willing to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice because God asked him to, but God intervened. A weight is anything that we put before God. So he's saying, lay aside whatever weighs you down. Lay it down. And I got to confess to you, I was searching for some illustrations to share with this. And I came across something that was rather comical. David Postman was arrested in Providence, Rhode Island after allegedly knocking out an armored car driver and stealing the closest four bags of money. As it turned out, they contained $800 in pennies. They weighed 30 pounds each, and it slowed him down to a stagger during his getaway so the police officers easily jumped, easily jumped him from behind. But you know, David Possum was not the first person to make the mistake of trying to run while being weighed down. We do it every day. I know for a fact some of you came in with weights today. Can't deny it. We've got to, we've got to drop whatever weighs us down. We've got to lay it aside. 
It's been said, again, I'm referring to a weight that doesn't ne- it's not necessarily categorized as sin, but it's a weight. But it's been said that a good thing, listen, a good thing becomes a bad thing when it keeps you from the right thing. A good thing becomes a bad thing when it keeps you from the right thing or from the best thing. So you got to lay beside whatever weighs you down. And you got to leave behind whatever tires you out. Now, it's one thing to be slowed down. It's another thing to be tripped up. It's one thing to run with suitcases under your arm or four 30-pound bags of pennies. It's another thing to run with chains around your ankles. Um, And that's exactly what, what sin will do to you. Lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Now, there's a word, um, that, that word ensnare, it refers to a vine that wraps itself around a tree. And I don't know how many of you work in the yards regularly, but I love, I love to work in the yard. I enjoy working in the yard. Man, there's some vines. I found out that there's some vines that will grow, and those things grow rapidly. They'll wrap around a tree. They'll race across your lawn. What about kudzu? Anybody know about kudzu? Yeah, apparently you do. Do you know that scientists, and I want to read this, scientists have discovered that um, there's one thing impervious to a nuclear bomb, and it's kudzu. I think the only way kudzu will be removed from the earth is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But can I equate it to this sin? It's like spiritual kudzu. It, it begins to weave itself around your life until you find yourself entangled by it. And Cast and Crowns has that song that says it, it's a slow fade. It's a slow growth. It just kind of starts and it weaves itself around until it, it's got a hold of you. It's finally got, it's got a hold of you. So sin is something we've got to leave behind. So the weights, drop the weights. Leave the sin behind. And then finally, the third thing, we've got to look beyond to the one who picks us up. Verse 1 through 3. Therefore, we, are also, uh, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Endurance. Endurance is a word that means determination. I'm determined that I'm going to do it. You thinking about quitting? We've heard the phrase, quitters never win and winners never quit. So we have to run with endurance. We have to run with determination. And I'll tell you why endurance is important. Guys, it's not a sprint. It's not a 100-yard dash. It's a marathon. It's a marathon. It takes strength and endurance to continue persevering, going on through, going on to the finish line. And I want to tell you something. Jesus is not measuring us with a stopwatch today. He's not measuring us with a stopwatch. He, now, he is. He does have the yardstick out, and he's measuring us with the yardstick. But he's not looking at how fast we run. He's not looking at how far we run. And he wants us to run with determination. He says, you got to do it by focusing on the finish. Focusing on the finish. Run with endurance and focus on on the finish. Looking unto Jesus. Now, this is something that's it's very interesting. And we talked about what we read before 
um, the things that were written before, before our learning. If we don't have another example, we've got Jesus. You can, you can dismiss Job, you can dismiss Joseph, you can dismiss David, you can dismiss anybody else who persevered through difficult times. You can dismiss Moses, you can dismiss Noah, but, but, but would you at least, would you at least consider Jesus? Would you consider Jesus? When he knelt in the garden and said, Lord, I don't want to do this. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Would you consider him? Who was weak in that moment? And he said, God, I, I don't want to do it. He didn't say, I can't do it. He said, I don't want to do it. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. Looking unto Jesus, he is the author. He is the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He despised the shame. And he finished. Do you know how he finished? He sat down at the right hand of God. He sat down at the right hand of God. When he says, look unto Jesus, he's saying, you not only must run your race with determination, you've got to do it with concentration. You've got to do it with concentration. Jesus did. He finished in the midst of persecution, rejection, and hatred, but he still finished. You've got to put on those spiritual blinders, like I said before, and just focus in on the finish line. You've got a message that hurt you. You got someone who's angry with you. Get your eyes off of people. Get your eyes off of self. Get your eyes on Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Cora Chen Boom said something that was very true. Here's what she said. And if you know the story of Cora Chen Boom, she's crippled. <laughs> she had the wherewithal to say this. If you look within, you'll get depressed. If you look without, you'll get distressed. <laughs> but if you look at Jesus, you'll be at rest. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Imagine, imagine John Stephen Aquari. He's running in this video. He's running, he looks and listens to the crowd, and he begins to look around. Looks to see if his mom's there. Looks to see if his dad's there. Turns and looks at the green grass in the infield. He didn't do that. His mind was focused on one thing. His mind was focused on finishing the race. His mind was focused on finishing the race. I got to admit to you that there's a lot of things I've started and didn't finish in life. I can't tell you how many times I've started a recording album and I get halfway into it and it was never good enough I get discouraged I can't sing I can't produce can't do anything worth anything and just quit do you realize what we have in this sanctuary today the lighting that we have Thomas Edison, do you realize what lengths he went to for us to be able to have light? I want to read you the story because there's no way I could memorize this. Thomas Edison did not give up on his first efforts to find an effective filament for the incandescent lamp. He did countless experiments with countless materials. 
As each failed, he would toss it out the window. The pile reached the second story of his house. Eventually, he sent men into many different countries, such as Japan, South Africa, Asia, Jamaica, Silent, Burma, in search of fibers and grasses to be tested in his lab. One weary day on October 21st, 1879, after 13, 13 months of repeated failures, 13 months, he succeeded in his search for a filament that would stand the stress of electric current. This is how it happened. Casually picking up a bit of lamp black, he mixed it with tar and rolled it in a thin thread. Then the thought occurred to him, why not try carbonizing carbon fiber, cotton fiber? For five hours he worked, but each time it broke before it could be removed from the mold. Two spools of thread were used. <laughs> At last, a perfect strand emerged only to be ruined while being placed in a glass tube. However, Edison refused to be defeated. He worked nonstop for two days and nights without sleep. Finally, he managed to slip one of the carbonized threads into the sealed glass bulb. When he turned on the current, he beheld a sight that he had worked so long for. The bulb burned and provided light. What if Thomas Edison was a quitter? You say, well, somebody else could have done it. Are you sure? Quitters never win, and winners never quit. Things we didn't finish. What about you? Are you going to finish? My dad always told me, and our worship team has heard me say this a lot of times, what happens in the middle is not nearly as important as what happens at the beginning and the end. The two most important parts of a song are the beginning and the end. At least finish strong. Again, I want to remind you that, that finishing is important, uh, or starting is important, but finishing is the most important thing. Consider him who endures such hostility from sinners himself, lest you become weary and discouraged. <clears throat> how many of you, how many of you uh, have the ESPN app on your phone? Do you have the ESPN app? Do you get those notifications? Maybe on your watch, you get those notifications. Uh, it shows you videos. A few weeks ago, I got this notification of a video. It was a quote-unquote must-see video. And I want to direct your attention to uh, Talia Crawford. Talia Crawford, um, Talia Crawford was uh, it's a seven-year-old girl. Her dad is an American boxer, and she was in a track meet. And I want you to watch what happens in this video. We got some sound? Got it muted? Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Dave, I want you to start that over. I want you to start it over from the beginning. And I want you to look over here in the right. Start it over and look right here in the right-hand corner. I want you to watch what happened. <laughs> it's not how you start, guys. It's how you finish. It's not how you start. It's how you finish. I got to tell you, Easton, <laughs> Friday when I downloaded that video, Easton was playing, what's that, Daddy? What's that? And I showed him how to start it and stop it, and he watched it. And he started running around, lay, 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 lay. 
God's going to tell you, there's going to be obstacles. You're going to stumble. You're going to fall. You're going to trip up. But lay aside the weights. Leave behind whatever weighs you down. Whatever tires you out, look beyond to the one who picks you up. Focus on the finish. Finish well. At the end, you're going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. I want to invite our worship team to come up. There's one more illustration I want to show you. There's one race that occurs in the Olympics every four years where the competitors are not allowed to see the finish line. Now, think about it. Dave, show this picture. Every four years, this race happens in the Olympics. It's called sculling. It's called sculling. Those long, beautiful, sleek boats, they get in there, and those guys row with all their might. They row in sync. They're pulling. They're straining. And think about it. They're on that beautiful lake, and they're rowing as hard as they can, but they got their backs to the finish. They don't even know how close or how far they are. How do they even know when the race is over? How do they know when they're close to the finish line? Well, the answer is that they focus on a man called the coxswain, right there, the guy with the little mouthpiece. He's the coxswain. He sits up in the bow of the boat and he's calling out the cadence. He tells them when to row, how to row. And he's calling out signals and he's telling them 200 yards, 150 yards, 50 yards. And then you're at the finish. You know what they have to do, those guys? They just got to keep their eyes on him. Just keep your eyes on him. Keep your eyes on him. Keep your eyes on him. Get them off everybody else. If we're running our race, if we're running our race like we're supposed to, we don't have time to worry about anybody else. We don't have time to criticize anybody else. Keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Let's stand and we're going to pray. We're going to have an invitation. You get a chance to come. Lay your weights down. Lay your sins down. Give it to Jesus. Lord, I pray that people would not be just transparent and honest with you. They'd be transparent and honest with themselves. Be glorified in this place. Change hearts and lives. In Jesus' name. Come if you need to. Lord, I come. I confess. Bowing here. I find my rest. And without you. Your grace is more 
where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I Temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. I want to sing, I want to sing, Dave, I want to sing that last verse. Where sin run deep, runs deep, your grace is more. Sing that. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found, is where you are, is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. You're my one defense. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. So I hope, I hope your heart and mind is clear today. I hope that no weights prohibit you from running freely. I hope that no sin entangles you. I hope that there's nothing keeping you from focusing and concentrating on Jesus who serves as our coxswain. We keep our eyes fixed on him. We row together. We serve together. We'll see great things. You may be seated.